I want to introduce our keynote speaker. And he's going to speak about a very important issue that affects all of us, and that is the relationship between Islam and the West, and that paradigm of Islam and the West, and how American Muslims can make an impact on that relationship. He used to work for RAND Corporation in the Middle East Center. He's a retired CIA officer uh, from 29 years ago. He has a wealth of knowledge. He's written several books. The most recent book he's written is called A World Without Islam, where he is talking about how the world geopolitically would not change even without Islam and how um, really this is, there's a much more positive relationship than people uh, are aware of. He also wrote Geopolitics Between Islam and the West uh, and the Future of Political Islam. His recent novel is called Breaking Faith. Um, and we're going to have him also do book signing at the end of the banquet in the lobby. So you, you definitely want to get his books and get him to sign that for you at the end of the banquet. So with that, please welcome our friend and uh, really a scholar in this uh, subject, uh, Mr. Graham Fuller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Um, I can't tell you how honored I am to be here tonight. I have the privilege of having known uh, Salam for, I hate to think how long it's been, an easy 20, 25 years since when I first came out to Rand Corporation here in Santa Monica uh, a long time ago. And we've been good friends and shared concerns about the region for a very, very long time. Um, I've actually, uh, I've, a lot of people assume that because I was in CIA, therefore I got interested in Islam and maybe it was not such a good, you know, maybe had darker motives and all of that. I was interested in Islam in the Middle East since I was about 15 years old. Uh, I heard about Islam and Arabic writing long before I ever heard of CIA. Um, I was intrigued by pictures of the Middle East and this, cra this seeming crazy writing uh, Arabic script that I, I, I wanted to know how to read that. Uh, I was just grabbed by it. So my interest in it goes a long way back. Um, I got drafted into the military on the days when there was a draft and got put into intelligence, which I didn't have a clue as to what that was about. It ended up in CIA, blah, blah, and it's a long story, but I left, as, as Salam mentioned, I left CIA 29 years ago, and it was a very different place, uh, believe it or not, in those days than it is today. <clears throat> I'm particularly thrilled to talk to you because I have a more vivid sense than ever in coming back down to LA. I don't live here anymore. I now live in Vancouver for the last 12 years. Uh, but coming back down here and seeing the work of MPAC and the community and the variety of people and the excitement and the progress, even in, yes, these, these very dark uh, moments that we're passing through with one uh, form of, uh, of violence or another. And if it's not violence in the United States, uh, by somebody against somebody else, then it's violence overseas and particularly in the Muslim world. I mean, I hate to think of the number of Muslims who have died in the Middle East for one reason or another over the last uh, 15 years. So let me make a couple of quick points here tonight. And the first is to briefly discuss the theme of my book, for a book of, I don't know, three, four years ago, five years ago maybe, called uh, a world without Islam. Now, some people who just hear the title assumed that it's a book saying, yeah, what a great place it would be without Islam. Uh, if you open up the book and read the first paragraph, you will know that that is not what the book is about at all. I wrote it with a kind of in-your-face dramatic or kind of shocking title because I wanted to draw attention to the major theme of this book, which is that if there had been no Prophet Muhammad, if there had been no Islam, that the relationship between the Middle East, the area of the Middle East, 
and the West today would not be significantly different. And I point to some dozen different factors at, at some length, um, uh, talking about you know going back to Crusades and uh, the long reign of Western imperialism, British, French, uh, Russian imperialism in Muslim areas, uh, others that which have added to to this legacy of of uh, grievance, uh, the constant Western interference even after the end of colonialism, the struggle for uh, oil resources, energy resources, the seizure of energy resources periodically by Western uh, powers, the implanting of dictators who would do America's bidding or Britain's bidding uh, in the region for a very long period of time, and that is not over yet. Um, the whole, the whole tragic background uh, of the uh, of the cre creation of the state of Israel, uh, in which Muslims and Palestinians, in particular Christians and Muslims, paid the terrible price for what Europeans had done, in a savage fashion, had done to European Jews. But as I argue in the book, if the Jews, European Jews, coming to the Middle East uh, had encountered Christian Palestinians or Buddhist Palestinians or Hindu Palestinians, the Palestinians would have been equally unhappy at losing their land uh, and losing their property and being displaced. So it really has nothing to do with religion whatsoever, although many people like to play it up as such. So why am I mentioning these things? Is this just an interesting exercise in in historical fun facts or something? No, it really matters as to what we think is the nature of conflict between the area of the Middle East and the West. And I'm claiming that it is not fundamentally about religion at all, but about politics and territory and power and resources and, and everything else. But why does this matter? It matters because if we say, ah, it's a clash of civilizations, it's Islam against the West, Islam against Christianity or whatever, then, ladies and gentlemen, what can you do about it? What can I do about that? This is insoluble, in effect, when you have a clash of civilizations. It'll seemingly go on forever. But if you say, no, this is not about religion as such. This is about all these grievances that I mentioned, all of which we can manage, all of which are negotiable. And in all of these issues, there are pros and cons on each side of the issue. But they are negotiable. They can be talked about, and change can and does take place as a result uh, of discussions of these issues. So one is a statement that there's nothing that we can do about this deep, fundamental, primal clash, and the other is saying, look, we've got some quite serious, discrete issues, and today, of course, terrorism in all its different meanings, state terrorism and private terrorism, uh, all of these are things that we can work on, and that, that's why I think this, the message is imp important and why I, I wrote the book. You know, it's interesting that a number of people, when I sometimes talk about these things with Christian groups or any, any group, people will often say, they'll sigh, and they'll say, you know, maybe the world would have been a much better place, actually, without religion at all. Well, you know, if you think about that for three seconds, you will begin to see the fallacy of that argument, because we have just moved out of probably the most hideous century of humanity, namely the 20th century, when we had hideous World War I, uh, even worse, World War II, uh, hundreds of millions of people dying in these things, uh, communist revolution in the Soviet Union, uh, we had Hitler, uh, we had Mussolini, uh, we had Mao Zedong, uh, who, met, who personally is maybe responsible for, for policies that led to the deaths of, of maybe 100 million Chinese in one way or another. Where is religion in all of this? 
most of these leaders that we're talking about are not only not religious, they are actively atheist. So you don't have to have religion to have savage conflict, as we have seen in this last century. But religion, is an, it's, it's a powerful thing in human life, and leaders like to draw on it. No leader can allow religion to be left alone uh, because it's something to be manipulated uh, and, and, and used. So they hold up banners. We're not fighting for oil or we're not fighting for territory or we're not fighting for leadership or whatever. We're fighting to make the world free for democracy or we're fighting uh, in the Nazi case to uh, for the sake of the master race or in the case of the Soviet Union, we're fighting for the liberation of working classes all over the world. People like to raise big banners to justify what they do. And that is just as true today. Christians do it, Muslims do it, Buddhists do it, uh, Hindus do it. They use religious tools and implements to achieve their goals. I think it's very vicious and very dangerous, but this is the human condition. Um, also, one other argument about what if we didn't have any religions at all, wouldn't, wouldn't we all be more peaceful? I hate to say it, but I think as I grow older and watch the world and read the history of the world, you know, I think human beings have some propensity to, to fight. They like to fight. They may have one or another cause for which they fight, but I think there's something in the human psyche that apart from caring, also likes to fight. And I don't think you need religion to undertake those fights and struggles. And if you had no religion, I don't think the amount of killing would be any less in the world today than it is with religion. Uh, I, and indeed, I hope that religion, as is in the case with the work that MPAC is doing, can influence more pass peaceful thinking, as among Christians and as among many Jews as well who are concerned on the subject. Okay, um, you know, I, I hardly need to tell you, because you're living here and in the middle of all of this, and I'm not even uh, directly uh, a Muslim, perhaps honorary Muslim, this is very tough time. <laughs> Thank you. This is very tough time for what we're going through in the world, in the Middle East, uh, and in the United States, and now in Europe with the backlash of uh, ISIS, where we see refugees fleeing into Europe and destabilizing Europe, working up. Europe is a small place and they're small societies and they're fragile societies and they cannot absorb the millions of refugees that Canada can, that the US can, that Australia can. So it is, it is undermining the very fabric of European generosity and liberality of thinking and that is something else that, that disturbs me uh, very much about what, what we're seeing in today. Also, you know, I think for Muslims, this is, from my point of view and perspective, and I've been working in the Middle I've been interested since age 15 and working, living in the Middle East since uh, 19, I don't know, 60 or something, 60, 63. Um, I don't think I've ever seen this amount of violence that has gone on. Um, also, I, uh, that's negative. On the positive side, I don't think there has ever been quite such a consciousness of ummah on the part of Muslims as there is today. It's because of world knowledge, information, uh, communications technology, travel, education. Everywhere in the world, Muslims now are vividly aware of all other Muslims. They watch it on prime television, so Iraqis watch uh, you know, things that are going on in Bangladesh and uh, Kashmiris are watching what's going on in Palestine. It's a big, the, the world has gotten a lot, a lot smaller, but so has the sense of Ummah. There's a much more vivid sense of Ummah and the, the variety of Islam that exists today uh, that maybe was, was not quite so strong uh, many, in a, in a hundred years ago. I, I hate to say it, but 
having lived in the Arab world, Arab friends have told me that there's sort of sometimes a deeper suspicion among some Arabs anyway, that you know, the, to be a real, the real Muslims are the Arabs and others are welcome, but that's where it started. Yes, it did start there. But as we know, Islam comes in a huge variety of, of, of uh, colors and cultures and, and civilizations that make it exceptionally rich. Okay, um, a few other thoughts that I would like to uh, leave with you here. When we're thinking about terrorism, and particularly in a place, well, anywhere in the world, people who, what is it that makes anybody willing to go out and kill or die in the name of something? And especially when we're talking about religion, and especially even more terrifying today than simply the violence in the Middle East is the emergence of sectarianism, of Sunni against Shia, that did not really exist in the times that I have been living uh, in that area. Indeed, I wrote a book with, a, with a, an Iraqi Shia woman, American, uh, called uh, The Arab Shia, The Forgotten Muslims. Uh, she had a mother who was, mother was uh, Sunni and her father was Shiite. Uh, this was absolutely normal in Iraq 30, 40 years ago. Today, it's unthinkable. So this reminds us that much of this is very, very new. What is it that causes people, Sunni or Shia, or anybody else for that matter, to be willing to fight, kill, and die for the sake of something. I don't think, again, here again, I don't think it's about religion, because there's no way you can possibly justify why you would be willing to kill somebody or die trying to do so over the theological differences between Sunni and Shiite Islam. What is clear is that there are Sunni Islamic communities that are of long standing, and there are Shiite communities of long standing, indeed going back to the, the very days of, of the last days of the Prophet. But we're here we are talking again about communities and we're talking about interests and power, power of one community against another. I know ISIS talks a very good line about uh, all this takfir of, of Shia, et cetera, but you know that something else is going on because it just cannot matter that much in our normal civilized lives that we are willing to kill and die over minute theological differences. It's not just Islam. Christians have killed each other seemingly for the same reasons for quite a long time between uh, Catholic, Catholicism and Protestantism. You know Northern Ireland where people come from exactly the same background and live in exactly the same place, killing each other. It's not about Protestantism and Catholicism at all. It's about something else, it's power. The security of one community against another community that's threatening him. You can call it community A and community B or commu red community and blue community, whatever you want to call it, it is not about theology. Let me, you've had a long night and you've been, had a lot of speechifying here, a lot of it very fine, very stimulating. I would just like to offer a few thoughts about the role of Muslims in the West. I'm sure you've thought about these, you've had I know there are many fine speakers you've had over the years, so I may not say anything that's new, but it's my perspective on having lived through um, much of this period. The long, I was raised a Christian. Um, I, I won't go in through the whole story, but after living in other parts of the world and the Middle East, I found it impossible after a while to believe that Christianity had the sole message of the, with the sole correct version of what is going on in history. Christianity is a very rich religion. It's incredible theology, it's arts, it's sciences, it's philosophies, it's histories of all kinds of things, and amazingly rich. So is Islam, amazingly rich. But I have 
come to feel, and I've lived in Buddhist societies and others that I also had a very great uh, interest in, I've come to feel that in the end, there, there's a wonderful saying that there are many roads, many paths to the top of the mountain. I think if you're a Muslim, you are a member of a proud, long, rich tradition that is getting richer and growing in the world as, cons as Muslims travel and, and other, other cultures come in contact with Islam. This, this is very enriching. It's enriching for Muslims and it's enriching, enriching for everybody else. There's a very remarkable woman who was a Catholic nun way back. Some of you may have heard of her named Karen Armstrong, uh, who wrote, good, she's a great woman. And she's written, she's written about the prophet, as a, book, a very excellent book about the prophet Muhammad as well. Um, she wrote a book with a fascinating title called A History of God. I mean, seemingly shocking title, A History of God. How, it's blasphemy, how dare you write a history of God. But her point was, it wasn't really a history of God, it was a history of human understanding of God. And she goes way back four or 5,000 years, uh, as far back as people can reach in, 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 in written language, to look at different ways human beings have thought about God over the passage of time. And it has been major change, even in Judaism alone, which she devotes some space to, but in Christianity and elsewhere. The world changes, we change, conditions change, our education, our knowledge changes. How could our understanding of religion not change? It's not that Islam will change, it's our understanding of Islam, or our understanding of Christianity, or our understanding of Buddhism. That will change in these contemporary circumstances. So I think to feel, for any nervousness that somehow this is getting into, uh, getting into some kind of theological uh, riskiness and impropriety or bid'ah or something like that, I think is, is, is misplaced. We can only grow richer through our knowledge of other cultures and other religions. I'm sure you've already experienced that in living uh, in this country. We learn what is good about other religions and what's not so good about other religions. And we tend then to see ourselves a little more clearly. I think that is wonderful. And that is what is so great about a country like the US, like Canada, like Australia, uh, where there is, where the, we are all immigrants in one way or another and we're all learning from each other. So I think in this sense, Muslims should feel very heartened about um, where they are going in the long run as we work through this um, rather more, more difficult uh, period that we, uh, that we are going through. Muslims are not visitors to the West. You, you are the West, and if I think back again on how our understanding of religion has changed, if we go back to Christian and Muslim understanding a thousand years ago, we, had, we talked about Dar al-Harp or Dar al-Salam. These were very distinct areas. It wasn't, it wasn't just because there was enmity. They were clearly distinct areas of the world, and people didn't travel very much back and forth. And some theologians said it was haram, even to, for Muslims, to live in a non-Muslim place. At that time, that was perhaps an understandable view but our views have evolved, and today that would be an absurdity. The world is enriched by the expansion of everybody uh, moving um, everywhere else. So I am really very positive about where Muslims can go. Uh, to give us the simplest example, I was quite thrilled a year or two ago going through Homeland Security, if you can believe it, being thrilled. Going I went through Homeland Security in Washington, D.C., and one of the women uh, who came up with the magic wand uh, against my body was wearing a hijab. And I thought that was fabulous. I, oh, I overcame all my distaste for Homeland Security procedures uh, in, at that moment. 
So if we don't think that's not change, and we've had several other speakers who have talked about change that we've all witnessed, that is yet one more. So I'm really very positive. I am so enthused by the work that I, that I know that Salam and all of his staff and all of you and the community and everything else are doing here to bring change in this society. It has come, it is coming, it will come and the role of American Islam, free to think anything you want within the context of religious thought, cannot hope to do. How can Muslims living in Afghanistan, how can Muslims living in tortured Pakistan, tortured Afghanistan, tortured Iraq, tortured Syria, tortured Yemen, tortured Somalia, tortured Palestine, and the list goes on. How can we expect these people to have the time and the peace of mind to think more deeply about the meaning of Islam in the contemporary world? They are trying to survive. They're trying to keep alive and keep their children alive and keep them, themselves fed and not to have to get on a boat and have their children drown and, uh, halfway across the ocean going to another foreign country where they may not be accepted. These people do not have the luxury to think about anything except survival. But you, <laughs> but you do. We are blessed to be living in these glorious cities. We're comfortably fed, we're comfortably housed, we're informed or educated. And you do have the, the, lug, the luxury, the time, and the creativity to think more bro ever more broadly about the meaning of your faith in this contemporary world. And it does change thoughts that were unthinkable for all of us, Christians and everybody else 50 years ago, even 30 years ago, are now becoming commonplace, good and bad. So be blessed in that sense that you have extraordinary responsibility to bring the message of Western thoughts about Islam back to the Muslim world that is in desperate shape and looking for anything that can help them through their political, military, social, economic uh, crises uh, that uh, they live under today. Thank you very much.